Hi there, and welcome back. I think this is going to be a fantastic episode. Welcome to day number 137. Today we start two books, 1 Samuel, and we read Psalm 90, and the first chapter of Romans. So let's start 1 Samuel. Yesterday we heard the charming conclusion of the story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. The words of the town women have prophetic significance. Praise the Lord who has now provided a Redeemer for your family. The words have a double meaning for us today as we see them looking forward to Jesus, our Redeemer. Now, if you have been listening closely, you didn't hear the word Redeemer in the Good News Translation. That word actually happens eight times in the book of Ruth, beginning at chapter 2, verse 20. The Good News Translation translated the correct meaning as a close relative of ours, one of those responsible for taking care of us. The term meant much more than, for instance, redeeming a family member who had been sold into slavery. The nearest kinsman would also revenge a murder or marry a widow of a close family member. The advantage of the Good News Translation's term is that it accurately shows the meaning. But the advantage of translating using the word Redeemer is that readers will more quickly see the correspondence between what Boaz did with Jesus, who both came from Boaz's line and is our Redeemer. And now about 1 Samuel. Continuing the history of Israel, we now move to the transition from the period of judges to the period of kings, The books of 1st and 2nd Samuel were originally one book in the Hebrew Scripture. They were separated in the Greek Septuagint. The books were named after Samuel, not written by him. In 1st Samuel, we see that Samuel is not just a judge, but also a prophet, and that he anointed both Saul and David. This book contains many of the favorite Bible stories told to children. 1 Samuel 1 There was a man named Elkanah from the tribe of Ephraim who lived in the town of Ramah in the hill country of Ephraim. He was the son of Jeroham and grandson of Elihu and belonged to the family of Tohu, a part of the clan of Zuf. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Every year Elkanah went from Ramah to worship and offer sacrifices to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Each time Elkanah offered his sacrifice, he would give one share of the meat to Penina and one share to each of her children. And even though he loved Hannah very much, he would give her only one share, because the Lord had kept her from having children. Penina, her rival, would torment and humiliate her, because the Lord had kept her childless. This went on year after year. Whenever they went to the house of the Lord, Penina would upset Hannah so much that she would cry and refuse to eat anything. Her husband, Elkanah, would ask her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why are you always so sad? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? One time, after they had finished their meal in the house of the Lord at Shiloh, Hannah got up. She was deeply distressed, and she cried bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Meanwhile, Eli, the priest, was sitting in his place by the door. Hannah made a solemn promise. Lord Almighty, look at me, your servant. See my trouble and remember me. Don't forget me. If you give me a son, I promise that I will dedicate him to you for his whole life and that he will never have his hair cut. 
Hannah continued to pray to the Lord for a long time, and Eli watched her lips. She was praying silently. Her lips were moving, but she made no sound. So Eli thought that she was drunk. And he said to her, Stop making a drunken show of yourself. Stop your drinking and sober up. She answered, No, I'm not drunk, sir. I haven't been drinking. I'm desperate. I've been praying, pouring out my troubles to the Lord. Don't think that I'm a worthless woman. I have been praying like this because I'm so miserable. Ellie replied, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you have asked him for. She replied, May you always think kindly of me. Then she went away, ate some food, and was no longer sad. The next morning Elkanah and his family got up early, and after worshipping the Lord they went back home to Ramah. Elkanah had intercourse with his wife Hannah, and the Lord answered her prayer. So it was that she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, and explained, I asked the Lord for him. Footnote. The name Samuel actually means name of God, but has some sounds that are similar to the Hebrew verb translated asked. The time came again for Elkanah and his family to go to Shiloh and offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and the special sacrifice he had promised. But this time Hannah did not go. She told her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will take him to the house of the Lord, where he will stay all his life. Elkanah answered, All right, do whatever you think best. Stay at home until you have weaned him. And may the Lord make your promise come true. So Hannah stayed at home and nursed her child. After she had weaned him, she took him to Shiloh, taking along a three-year-old bull, a bushel of flour, and a leather bag full of wine. She took Samuel, young as he was, to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. After they had killed the bull, they took the child to Eli. Hannah said to him, Excuse me, sir, do you remember me? I'm the woman you saw standing here praying to the Lord. I asked him for this child, and he gave me what I asked for. So I am dedicating him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he will belong to the Lord. Then they worshipped the Lord there. Let's turn now to Psalm 90. The traditional titles in the Psalms, given as headings or sometimes as footnotes in our Bibles, were written centuries afterward by the rabbis, and we need not consider them part of the inspired word. This title of Psalm 90 may identify Moses as the author, or the rabbis may have meant that this psalm reflects a mosaic perspective. No other psalm is labeled like this one. This is a good psalm for meditating on the meaning of our life and our short lifespan. The Hebrew title, according to the GNT, is A Prayer by Moses, the Man of God. Psalm 90 O Lord, you have always been our home. Before you created the hills or brought the world into being, you were eternally God and will be God forever. You tell us to return to what we were. You change us back to dust. A thousand years to you are like one day. They are like yesterday, already gone, like a short hour in the night. You carry us away like a flood. We last no longer than a dream. We are like weeds that sprout in the morning, that grow and burst into bloom, then dry up and die in the evening. 
We are destroyed by your anger. We are terrified by your fury. You place our sins before you, our secret sins where you can see them. Our life is cut short by your anger. It fades away like a whisper. Seventy years is all we have. Eighty years if we're strong. Yet all they bring us is trouble and sorrow. Life is soon over and we are gone. Who has felt the full power of your anger? Who knows what fear your fury can bring? Teach us how short our life is, so that we may become wise. How much longer will your anger last? Have pity, O Lord, on your servants. Fill us each morning with your constant love so that we may sing and be glad all our life. Give us now as much happiness as the sadness you gave us during all our years of misery. Let us, your servants, see your mighty deeds. Let our descendants see your glorious might. Lord, our God, May your blessings be with us. Give us success in all we do. Let's turn now to Romans. Yesterday in the final chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul continued giving instructions on how to teach particular groups in the church, ending with teachings for slaves and for rich people. Note that those who give generously to help others store up heavenly treasures and, quote, a good foundation for the future. Paul's closing encouragements to Timothy are moving because we can sense Paul's deep love for Timothy. We move back in time slightly from 1 Timothy to Romans, Romans was written perhaps six to nine years before 1 Timothy, written at the time that Paul was in Corinth. The topic sentence for Romans is chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and the book is an outstanding presentation of this thesis in impeccable logic. As a translator, I often use those two verses as an example of how hard it is to understand a literal translation versus a meaning-based translation. I encourage you to compare chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 in the NLT or the GNT with something like the ESV to see what I mean. Romans 1 From Paul a servant of Christ Jesus and an apostle chosen and called by God to preach his good news. The good news was promised long ago by God through his prophets, as written in the Holy Scriptures. It is about his Son, our Lord Christ Jesus. As to his humanity, he was born a descendant of David. As to his divine holiness, He was shown with great power to be the Son of God by being raised from death. Through Him, God gave me the privilege of being an apostle for the sake of Christ, in order to lead people of all nations to believe and obey. This also includes you who are in Rome, whom God has called to belong to Christ Jesus. And so I write to all of you in Rome, whom God loves and has called to be his own people. May God, our Father, and the Lord Christ Jesus give you grace and peace. First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you, because the whole world is hearing about how you fully believe in Christ. God is my witness that what I say is true. The God whom I serve with all my heart by preaching the good news about His Son. 
God knows that I remember you every time I pray. I ask that God, in His good will, may at last make it possible for me to visit you now. For I want very much to see you, in order to share a spiritual blessing with you to make you strong. What I mean is that both you and I will be mutually encouraged to believe more fully in Christ. I want you to know, my friends, that many times I have planned to visit you, but something has always kept me from doing so. I want to win converts among you also, as I have among other Gentiles. For I have an obligation to all peoples, to the civilized and to the savage, to the educated and to the ignorant. So then, I'm eager to preach the good news to you also who live in Rome. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through believing from beginning to end. As the scripture says, The person who is put right with God through believing shall live. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing word and for the gospel. Thank you that the gospel is 100% based on believing in Christ. And Paul was 100% confident in this good news, the gospel. Father, please forgive our being timid and too ashamed to speak about Christ. Because of that, we miss out on seeing your amazing power in the gospel and how you bless people when they share it, listen to it, and believe in it. Help us today that we will realize the point of Psalm 90. O Lord, you have always been our home. Before you created the hills or brought the world into being, you were eternally God and will be God forever. You tell us to return to what we were. You change us back to dust. A thousand years to you are like one day, but we are like weeds that sprout in the morning, that grow and burst into bloom, then dry up and die in the evening. Teach us how short our life is, so that we may become wise. But, Lord, if we believe in the gospel, we will live forever with you. How foolish and short-sighted we are if we are ashamed of Christ and the saving message about him.